Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to CMS virtual visit. My name is Varun. Uh, I'm a scientist at University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I work on dark matter searches, Higgs searches, and the calorimeter and trigger system of the CMS experiment. And yeah, uh, I have two of my colleagues here. So yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Ashok Kumar. Uh, I am associate professor at Delhi University. Uh, these days, I am working at CERN for the phase two construction of the detector elements, specifically the muon detectors for the CMS upgrade. And I will be showing you uh, the underground service cavern parts of the of the cavern. Uh, we have a, a, a another expert, Ram Kishan, who will introduce to you. Hi, <clears throat> I am uh, Ram Sharma, and I am currently postdoctoral from I have Beijing. Uh, Beijing and working here at uh, CERN on the CMS experiment. I uh, mainly my research activities in exploring the, the in-depth properties of the Higgs boson, uh, uh, boson as well as on one of the R&D on the future upgrade of the detector, which is silicon-based detector named uh, high uh, granular calorimeter. Oh, thank you. Sure. Thank so you. Now we, so you can take a charge of the surface and begin. The principal would like to say something. Please, please, okay. please, sir. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we are quite uh, excited uh, out here. Uh, I would like to uh, mention, special mention of uh, Dr. Mandakini Patel, uh, who has been instrumental scientific officer uh, at uh, TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, because of her, this has been possible. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, the treasurer of our uh, mother institution, Parletric Vidyalaya Association, Sri Bansidhar Durandar, uh, who is our alumnus uh, from our college, is also here amongst us. Uh, I suppose uh, he is back there, uh, over there, raising his hands. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, myself, uh, Dr. Rajwade, I'm a student of physics. So uh, personally also, it's going to be a very, very enriching and exciting experience uh, coming to CERN without any cost, thanks to technology. And uh, I'm uh, welcoming uh, all my students here uh, from MSc, TYBSc, uh, uh, SYBSc at Sate College, where we are having this particular uh, virtual visit. Uh, we are joined by a community of other uh, students from colleges like Ramadan Junjunwala College at Ghatkopar, uh, in Mumbai, then uh, Dr. Shailendra Dahiwale and his MSc student in Pune. Uh, Pune we have, uh, earlier it was known as Pune University. Now it is Savit uh, Savitri Bai uh, Phule Pune University. So those, teach, uh, those students, teachers are with us and also some students from uh, Wilson College. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, see that we are connecting with uh, Naomi Beni, Dr. Ashok Kumar, uh, who, who spoke just now, uh, Varun Sharma, uh, and uh, Peta Barbaro. Uh, please forgive me if uh, my pronunciations are not right. And if I have not uh, missed out on someone, uh, I'm so very sorry. So we will not uh, waste any time. I think let us plunge into the uh, virtual visit. If there is anything Dr. Patil wants to add, uh, otherwise we are ready to go. Thank you. Uh, I will add few words about uh, the contribution of Mumbai itself. Uh, Baba right. Itamak Research Institute has uh, given the silicon sensors for the pre shower which is, you know, working in the CMS. Second is Tata Institute. Uh, I also worked at Tata Institute for a couple of years with Mandankani and her group. And there is a lot of contribution for providing scintillator detectors uh, in the HCAL, which is working fine. And then these days also, uh, through Mandankani Patel and her group, uh, there is a lot of work from the industry uh, for the for the upgrade of the experiment in the EGCAL, I mean, calorimeter, uh, the L1 cards. So there is a lot of contribution from industry which is happening. And we are very happy that uh, Mumbai has been a place where we started our career. And now whatever we are presenting here is also some ingredients we, we get from, uh, from Mumbai. So I speak a little bit of uh, Marathi. Everything is fine. But, uh, you know, uh, the, I like the food, I like the environment, I like the scientific endeavor of the Mumbai. Thank you very much. 
I just want to add, uh, whenever anybody of you uh, will land in Mumbai, we are right opposite the uh, airport. Okay? Ah, oh. Okay. Yeah. So okay. we are just off the and jump. So okay. if you stumble at the airport, you will find yourself. <laughs> yeah? Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. So Thank we you. start now. So yeah. Varun and uh, Aram Kishan will take a charge to explain you the, you know, they will take you to the introduction of the LSC and PMS uh, through some slides. And in the meanwhile, uh, uh, Joltan will be conducting the four virtual visit and uh, me and Noami will be going inside uh, the cavern to explain you a few, few things which you can see at the moment. Because we have the beam on, so we cannot go to the to show the real experiment, but we can show some parts of the service cavern which supports the structure of the CMS. Thank you. Yeah, just, yeah, just uh, uh, add. Thank, thank you so, so much, much uh, Ashok and uh, others for uh, giving a good introduction of the DIFR contribution. And really, we are excited and connect, getting to get connected to the real CMS experiment, which uh, sitting here remotely, all the students can actually see. So I think you can start. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again, everyone, and welcome to the CMS visit, uh, virtual visit. I hope you can see our screen and my uh, mouse moving around. So let me talk about CERN. You know, CERN, CERN has a lot of different experiments, but the two major ones uh, are the LHC, which is Large Hadron Collider, where we take you know, two particles, two protons, and we smash them at four different points. It is, and at each of these points, we put big, big giant detectors or big sensors that record whatever comes out you know, of these two colli collisions of protons. So we call it Large Hadron Collider because if you see, it's a machine that's sitting on the border of Switzerland and France, and it goes for about 27 kilometer. And hadrons, uh, for those who don't know what hadrons are, they are a family of particles that are made up of quarks. And quarks are fundamental particles that make up proton and neutrons and eventually nucleus. Okay, so here when we collide protons, we are actually colliding quarks or gluons. So they are accelerated to nearly speed of light and then they are smashed at four different sites again. Uh, and today you are, will be talk, hearing more about this one of these four detectors, which is named CMS, compact muon solenoid. And if we go to next slide, you know, uh, here just, uh, uh, I'll spend one minute here, you know, so the CERN accelerator complex, it's not just about large hadron collider. We take a, a you know, proton from a bottle of hydrogen gas, so it's, it's somewhere here. It's, it's not that bot big bottle, it's probably one liter of hydrogen gas, which we extract sent to a small linear accelerator, which is roughly 33 meters. Then it goes to a new, next level, which is booster. Then it goes to PS, proton synchrotron, uh, you know, roughly... 600 meter circular accelerator. Then it goes to a bigger accelerator called SPS, which is roughly seven kilometers. And then finally it goes to LHC. So if you see, there is a stepwise operation where you know at each level there is increase in the speed of the particles and the energy of the particles. And if you can read this you know, image correctly, you may see some ears written on this picture. So if you may realize this, you know, one of these uh, is as old as 1959. So CERN is not discarding old you know, machines, but they are continuously being upgraded and used for the newer, bigger machines. Okay, so this is how it looks, you know, this LHC is, you know, sitting underneath under the surface of the earth. And we are right now on the surface and Dr. Ashok will be going down roughly 90 meters and showing, showing you some of the facilities uh, when he'll be there. So. Okay, so these are the four big detectors, ATLAS, CMS. So out of these four big experiments, ATLAS and CMS are the two general purpose detectors that can do almost any physics uh, that we may have in a hadron-hadron collision. And the other two, which are relatively small experiments, ELISE and LHCB, are, more, uh, are made for something very precise or very small field of physics, like uh, the ELISE experiment, is made uh, so at LHC we do not collide just protons, but we because it's a nuclear lab we also collide some heavy ions. Uh, can you close this? Something oh, came yes. up. Right. There. Okay. So <clears throat> sorry for that. So you know, Alice, uh, we also collide some heavy nuclei like uh, lead ions 
or you know there is also plan to collide oxygen ions so we collide them and we call them heavy ion because they are heavier than the fundamental protons and ls detector is specialized to detect particles that are coming out of these uh, heavy ions and lhcb is to detect study b physics which we know have some special features which uh, uh, as a physicist or scientist we do not completely understand so this lhcb experiment has been built to understand more about this b physics I would say that uh, Ashok is around. Okay, so now I hand over to Ashok to talk about some other things. Yeah. Ashok. Okay, so now we are going in. So you can see that there is a radiation dosimeter. Uh, I have to, you know, batch through this and then the door will open and I will go into the cavern. <clears throat> it will scan me. and the door will open. So now I am inside the access area of the service cavern. So uh, the iris scan and you know, this special dosimeter helps us to go into the service cavern and experimental cavern. Noemi is scanning her eyes and the door should open now. So it is through the eye scan that you go in. So here is the area where, you know, construction of the first uh, phase of the CMS. I'm talking about two phases. The first phase two will come in next few years. Right now, the phase one construction of the CMS has happened through these photos. You can see the many people working and in different areas, different elements were, you know, integrated uh to the to making to make the phase one cms sectors if you see these uh, scintillator detectors these were made in tata institute and punjab university so these are the specific thing in fact you see these honeycomb structures aluminium one and these cooling loops these are made in uh in mumbai industry and uh, were hosted and tested by tata institute okay let us go in through the uh through the uh, lift so this lift will uh, uh take us to the cavern, uh, which will be, uh, you know, uh, it is a big, biggest one and it is one of the mostly used lift, lift in the, in the, in the CMS. Minus two, right? Okay. It's still long. <laughs> you can show the minus. So you now you can see the parameters. We start from minus, uh, okay, okay, zero meter or something, and it will go uh, into the cavern. Okay, so, so let's just just get back to the uh, our theme. Yeah, I I just would like to say something for the audience. Uh, if you have any question, please don't hesitate. Uh, you can always cut in and, and ask us. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I had already talked a few words about, you know, LHC and different sun experiments. So I'll now talk more about the CMS, which stands for, you know, which is what uh, you are virtually looking at, at different components of this. So CMS stands for compact muon solenoid, and it's a very big detector. Uh, just to give you some hints about its geometry, so in lengthwise, it's roughly 25 meters, and in diameter or height, it's roughly 15 meters. So it's a really big detector, and it weighs about 14,000 tons, okay? And this detector has, it's not one big detector, but it's different small detectors put together. And why we need so many small detectors is because when we pro collide protons, different particles come out of this collision and different particles have different properties you know and uh, because different particles have different properties we need uh, different detectors to measure them so different what are different properties these are different particles have different mass different charge different spin or the way they interact as we know we have four fundamental forces nuclear weak nuclear strong or electromagnetic and gravity so you know not all, all particle feel all the four forces together. So 
they experience different forces. So we need different particle detectors to measure different properties of different particles. So that's why this, you know, CMS is like an onion where it has different layers and each layer is a different detector. So if you see here, the first set of layer is the tracking system of the CMS detector, which is obviously, as the name suggests, to measure the, so the tracks of the particles when they are moving through. Uh, and then we have two set of calorimeters. So calorimeters, for those who do not know, are detectors to measure energy. As the name suggests, calorie, calorie is a unit of energy and calorimeter is, you know, energy measurement. And because uh, there are different particles, so we need two types of calorimeter. One is electromagnetic calorimeter to measure energy of the electromagnetic particles and hadronic calorimeter to measure energy of the hadrons. And once we have measured the energy, we have seen the tracks, we need a very big magnet. What you see here, a superconducting solenoid. It is in fact the largest magnet in the world that is sitting in this big experiment. And why we need a magnet? If you try to think, you know, or you may have some of you or all of you may have studied that charge particle experience some force under the effect of magnetic field. So we use, make use of that property of the magnet to measure the charge of the particle. So if you see some particles are bending in one direction, the other particles are bending in the other direction and some particles are just traveling straight. So, you know, the magnet here acts as a detector and it will help us distinguish between the positive charge, let's say if this is a positive charge particle, the negative will bend in the opposite direction and the neutral particles will just travel straight. Okay, so we have just distinguished the charge of the particles and to know how big the charge is, it's plus one or minus two, we look at the curvature, which, you know, when we combine information of the tracking system with the magnet, we can tell what is the magnitude of the charge based on its radius of curvature. Okay, so going out of the, you know, the magnet, we have muon system. So what you see here is the muon detector. So muon particles, for those who do not know, are, you know, belongs to electron family, except that they are roughly 200 times heavier than electron. And because they have about 200 times heavier than electron, uh, while they are moving, uh, they interact very less with the other material or, you know, the material that they are encountering. So it takes... They have a longer lifetime, so when they move, they uh, interact uh, very less. And we need we can put place the muon detector at the very end, you know, of the our big detector. Now, so what you see is red layers here. These are not detectors. These are just steel structures to iron structure to hold the detector and to complete the magnetic field. So the in between the red layers is are these muon detectors where we measure the muons. So these hits that you see are the muon heads. Now, so that does not it affect the other electronics of the detector. So yeah, that's a very good question. So you know, all the uh, electronics that chosen is chosen in such a way that it's not get it's not magnetic. Okay, so yes, we have to make take that into consideration that we do not use magnetic material. Otherwise, even the nuts and the bolts that are used are non-magnetic. Otherwise, they will just fly. So I think we are going back. Yes, to yeah, yeah. And, and in the meantime, we got uh, a couple of questions. Yeah, we already answered one of them. Okay, fine, fine. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. okay, Ashok. Okay, we can see on this wall, the construction of this particular point. So you can see there are so many infrastructure which were, you know, digged out and there were people working on the site and we find some old coins, prehistorical coins here. And then we digged up like a well through these machines. And then you can see on the surface, we were building the elements of the CMS. These are typical iron structures to give you, to assist you in the magnetic field as Varun was explaining you. And then, you know, you can see the full well like a structure we call as like a shaft. To, de to 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 pull in these detectors from the surface to the to the cavern and then you can see one of the wheel being uh, you know transported from the surface to the bottom with all the detectors on the in the place on on uh, on one of the yoke so these big structures having tons of weights has been lowered using this well like structures you can see another wheel being lowered up roughly during 2005 to 2008 these wheel were you know, constructed on the surface and lower down to the experimental cavern. Lower down means roughly 
uh, 100 meter down into the into the tunnel so you can see a uh, different parts you can see here the barrel structure the the magnet structure being holding up different cooling circuits and bringing services to other detector elements this activity is happening was happening in the surface but all the elements were lowered down into the into the tunnel you can see the as you have seen on the surface this is the big tunnel 27 kilometer uh, tunnel and we are here cms is hosted in small village called sessi which is roughly you know few kilometers away from the airport of geneva now you can see that all these detector elements having you know you can see here for example a silicon detectors being assembled on the surface in meha lab in san and all these sensitive elements when they are assembled they were they were at uh, you know a transported to 0.5 sessi village and then lower down using this kind of a structures into the cms so this is what being shown on this wall the different kind of a transport activities the logistics activities and people working in different sites the meha site in which is very very close to geneva uh, uh, city then the sessi village which is at 0.5 and then to the cavern so all these different logistics has been explained in this wall and these activities happened between 2005 to 2008 roughly we go to the another point thank you it's okay we are disturbing you we are still on okay so you can see for example you can see this you know racks having different crates and crates having different modules now you can see green signal means these are on these are acquiring data from the service ca from the experimental cavern the cms experiment is having low voltage high voltage fiber cooling services why you need this because whenever you are consuming power on the detector elements you have to cool down some of the detector element for example muons are based upon the the gas mixture so you have to provide gases from the service cavern then you you are taking data from the service cavern uh, sorry uh, from the experiment through the fiber because fiber can give you the communication the readout signals very very fast everything is ported by the service cavern which is adjacent to the experimental cavern experiment experimental cavern has only the cms experiment but the sporting structures are based in this service cavern so these are crates which are hosting these kind of low voltage or high voltage crates or high voltage low voltage uh, boards so you can see many many racks here and there are so many branches of these racks that you know you can hear the sound my sound is maybe not clear but you can hear the sound of the cooling systems of the cooling turbines which are cooling the structures consuming the power uh, in these uh, boards or in this uh, crate so that is what being you know you can see noami will pass on and can show you very many different lines of these racks and these racks are hosting the fiber application uh, fiber services or uh, low voltage services or high voltage services or triggering card where varun himself is working so over to you varun and then we will be moving to the magnet area okay so do you hear me yeah We are we are still on. Okay. You can see you can see different fibers here. Uh, these are yellow and different color fibers no. here. And these boards are no, having they wanted the us to talk. trigger okay. Okay. the uh, trigger signals no, coming from not. the experiment to the to the boards. So different crates, different fiber services here for for different CMS subsystems. You have. different uh, crates okay. and particular racks okay. hosting these uh, services okay over to you varun okay thanks ashok so uh, ashok just talked about the trigger system so let me say you know first say why we need a trigger or what is a trigger it's in a our trigger. experiment okay so as you are seeing some of the trigger racks being shown to you what they are so lhc uh, is colliding 40 million times every second if you do not realize how big that number is uh, you know it, there is a collision every 25 nanosecond so what and each of this collision is roughly 2 megabyte for simplicity it's it's slightly bigger but let's say 2 megabyte so if you do a simple math 40 million times 2 megabyte is 80 petabyte of data every second that is lifetime of your all favorite movie or 
audio or whatever you know for lifetime of that playlist we are getting that every second so there is no way we can store that much data and there is no way we can process, uh, transport that data because the optical fiber when the detector was in place it carries just 8 to 10 gigabyte per second so we have to do filter out selectively the interesting physics event that can give us good physics okay so we need some filter system which we call the trigger system where we have roughly 500 algorithms running in parallel and the algorithms that we write here needs to be very simple very smart and very fast because we just have 3.6 microsecond time of available to make a decision where to keep this event or discard this event if and if we you know uh, make a wrong decision here. We are wasting effort of thousands of thousands of people of LHC and CMS that we are not selecting good data and we may not be able to do good physics once we record whatever we record. Okay, so we reduce from 40 million to 100,000 every second. And once we have this 100,000, and if you still multiply this number by two megabyte, it's still 200 gigabyte per second. And you know, it's just, I told you that we can just carry eight to 10 gigabyte per second, so it's still big. So we have another layer, layer of the trigger system, which is a big computing farm where we reduce even further and we reduce to just roughly 2000 events per second. So that's what CMS can take out of 40 million. And that's what we are taking. So, you know, so that's why the trigger system and what Ashok is showing you is, is a system which is sitting off the, of the experimental system. cabin in the service cabin and yeah, yeah. this is uh, this is high voltage system of one of the subsystem as varun was explaining your trigger system this is the high voltage system you have the you know in the red you can see the high voltage crates no I mean, we can show the crates and then in the back of the crates you have the boards and these the boards are being connected through the to the subsystem using this uh, copper cables so we call them as the high voltage cables in this case these high voltage cables supply, you know, several kilovolts of the of the power from here, from the surface to the experimental side. Now, when you carry this power, you can have dissipation of uh, of the power as well. So you have to calculate and keep in mind what kind of losses you foresee and what kind of uh, you know supply you you do. All these controls are from surface. Where Varun, Ramkishan, and Joltan are sitting, the controls are from there. You can see from there we are controlling all these uh, power units and also controlling the the temp the temperature the uh, the uh, voltage the current which is given to the sub detector. So I was just showing one of the rack. Now you can also see from the top you have the cooling. In in between you can provide the cooling through this unit. So all this is maintained for the substitute requirements of one of the high voltage uh, system. Thank you. Over to you, Varun. We will move to magnet area. Okay, maybe Ram Krishna will talk about. Okay, so is uh, so uh, so as uh, like uh, Varun already explained about how this uh, subsystem works and how like thoughtful uh, uh, here people designed uh, uh, designed these detectors based on the properties of uh, of these particles and how we will capture capture all of the particle which is there even if we can't capture one of them, which is the neutrino, but how we can indirectly compute using the simple mathematics and the physics thing. And <clears throat> here, uh, just one thing, uh, thing here, uh, uh, this, uh, this is a big detector, and this yellow thing that you can see is the beam pipe through which the proton, bunch of proton uh, comes and interact here at the center of this detector. And this point is the center of the detector. So the two uh, bunches collide and then, uh, then we can detect in the- If you don't mind, in the meantime, I show Ashok as well, okay? Yes. okay. You can keep continue yeah. talking. So, okay, let me talk a few things here, you know, just to give, uh, you know, for especially if the, for the young students who are in the audience, you know, what, exactly you know what simple things we measure out of this detector so just to tell you first you know in this big experiment we do very simple science okay which we have already studied a lot but in a very complicated way because as system becomes big it becomes much more complicated like if i as i talked about tracker 
So what information do you think we extract from the tracking system? You know, it's just when it's a silicon sex, uh, sensor or a pixels like you have on your phone screens or TV screens. When the particle hit this small sensor, we get the X, Y and Z coordinates. OK, we get this X, Y, Z coordinates from eight layers of tracking system that we have. And then we connect these eight dots and then we get this beautiful track. And this, we do a lot of fitting here to make this beautiful track, but the, the fundamental information that we extract from our tracking system is the coordinates, okay? Like you make your simple graphs or other fittings, you give points and you make them. And then uh, let me let Ashok talk because I think he's waiting and then I will continue to the calorie meters. Yeah, thank you. So we are outside the experiment now. As I told you, we are 100 meter, roughly 100 meter underground. The experiment is on right now. For example, there is a beam in the in the experiment. You can assume that the or radiation is being uh, present. So we cannot go inside the experiment, but you can feel that okay, we are in the experiment. Now magnetic field is on. Magnetic field for Tesla, we cannot you know uh, directly expose ourselves to magnetic field. So we have to be very very careful. If you have, if some of you or some of some parents or some nearby has done uh, you know two Tesla or three Tesla magnetic field. Uh, MRI, this is roughly four Tesla um, uh, uh, magnetic field we have. And then this is the door which uh, which get, helps us to go in, into the access of the CMS experiment. And everything, which, as we have done the access through this uh, dosimeter on the surface, this is a similar way to go in, the IRIS scan and then the uh, dosimeter batch. Now, since you know that the magnetic field is on, how to feel some magnetic field here? We have some pins here. I, I, I hope that you can see some pins here. For example, this is the iron structure, steel structure, and you can see there are some pins which are which are aligned. For example, here, for example, here, you know, these pins you can see. Okay, this is a presence of maybe micro Tesla or some part, small, smaller than a milli Tesla magnetic field, and you can feel this magnetic field. This is very, very small and have a very meager effect on the body uh, subsystem uh, system but you can see that you know magnetic field is still present outside the cms uh, experiment now why this is you know sometime it is sticking sometime it is not sticking you can feel the orientation of the spin uh, inside this uh, ss uh, structures and you can feel that the orientation will be according to the north pole or south pole so this is what we are seeing here you know they are standing like a, like a spin element and you can see if they are, you know, having a moment, this is due to the, uh, you know, falling of this element between the, between the, ah, yeah, oh, no, I mean, showing a very nice other structure. The orientation, we are not, we are just moving the mobile phone and, you know, the orientation of this uh, element is according to the orientation of the magnetic field. So this orientation you can feel as some of you have done experiment in your, uh, you know, uh, secondary school, high, high, higher secondary schools showing the magnetic field, but you can feel the orientation of this, uh, uh, elements according to the magnetic field lines. So this is what we are showing here. And then this is the part which is you know underground. Let me collect few pins here. This is the uh, this is the part you can. Oh, okay, no, I'm showing very nice uh, orientation of these two uh, pins here. Okay, let us move to the tunnel part. If you see, uh, we are roughly here in the in the CMS experiment, and you can feel that. This is the large hadron magnets through which the beam passes through. You, as you know that we have a proton proton collusion, so this means we will have two proton beams. So we will have a you know magnet structures. Uh, these are the magnetic uh, structures. So beam is passing through them. We need the magnetic field to bend the particles. We need the electrical um, electric field to give uh, the boost, the potential boost, to, or to give the energy to the particles. So if you see the structure, it is a bending structure. So the bending is done according to the circular path a proton have to take. And this tunnel is a photograph, but you can see that behind us, there is a similar structure somewhere nearby, which is giving a beam to the CMS experiment. You can also see that the, the big structure, the big 27 kilometer tunnel, which is having proton and proton collision set 14 tera electron volts roughly, is being you know uh, supported by small structures so you start with a very small hydrogen bottle and you uh, take out the electrons and just 
pass through the protons to these structures and increase the energy in steps. And then uh, in these steps, you reach up to uh, 14,000 of uh, GeV. So this uh, 14,000 of collision. So one proton will have 7,000 of GeV. So this 7,000 GeV is achieved in different steps. And these steps are called accelerating steps. So accelerator, the full accelerator um, complex of the sun is not only LSC, but also there are some old structures which are you know giving energy to the proton in different steps now i will show one more thing here that if you are going into the into the tunnel you may have to bear a helmet like this for your safety of the head because some of the uh, workers who are working uh, during the technical shutdown can you know can you can have a me mechanical incident so you have to safeguard your he uh, head here now if you have a so you know that uh, we are using superconducting magnets and superconductivity is achieved at very, very low temperatures. Now, these low temperatures are achieved by cooling, by cooling down the volume by, by helium. Now, this helium can have a leak in the cavern. If the people are working during technical shutdown and if there is a helium leak, you have to safeguard yourself. The first thing you will be missing is the oxygen. So these are the, uh, these are the you know, uh, instruments which we use to create oxygen and use them while evacuating from the incident. So these uh, uh, structures can create oxygen for say 30, 40 minutes, the time when you have uh, access to the surface and can, you know, can, uh, can provide you enough oxygen during that time. And also the helmet will save you uh, from any injury to the brain. The, any, any injury to the eyes can be, uh, you know, uh, can be protected using this, uh, these glasses. You are closing the volume, the nose nasal structure, but you can get the oxygen through the uh, inhale of the uh, oxygen from this uh, through the mouth from this structure, and then you have the these structures are always hosted in this uh, in the mass. So the point is, whenever the worker is working inside the experiment for repairing it or for maintaining it, we have to go through using a specific training to safeguard ourselves and also safeguard the environment we live. Okay. So these tunnel structures are very, very limited. And we always, whosoever goes in, have to have some safety protocol to access to the seven subsystems of the experiment. Over to you, Varun. Thank you. So, okay, now that Ashok, you know, brought uh, LHC, uh, I will, you know, before going to, back to CMS uh, uh, kilometer, uh, uh, you know, I will come back to LHC once for a moment. I'm miss missing a diagram. So, okay. So maybe coming back to the same picture here. So LHC, you know, uh, as a, is what is LHC first of all? How we accelerate particles? Uh, just to go. So the protons we do not collide one proton with another proton. It's a bunch of proton here, a bunch of proton here. That's what we collide cross. And each of these bunch has roughly two hundred billion protons. Okay. Now if you thinking, if you start to think that you know. Because protons are positive charged particles, there is no way you can keep 200 billion protons together. So you need some external force, which we give using very strong magnets. So accelerator is nothing but majorly magnets. So in LHC, there are primarily three types of magnets. One is a dipole, which has two poles, north and south. The quadrupoles, which have four poles, two north and two south. And sextopole, which has six poles, three north pole and three south poles. Okay, just remember magnets will always have north and south. It can the number of north and north south can increase, but it will always have a north and south pole. Okay. Now, what's the role of these magnets? As if you remember, in CMS, magnets are used to measure the charge of the particle, but in LHC, this, the magnets, which are again the superconducting magnets, have a very different role. First, to keep this 200 billion proton in a bunch together. So there is a bunch, and you have magnets all around this pipe which keeps give force from x uh, you know outside to keep this proton intact so this di you know quadrupole and sextopole magnets role is to keep the proton bunch intact and together and in a very narrow shape which is just like you can imagine as a pencil which is roughly 15 centimeter in length and uh, roughly a millimeter or smaller in diameter okay so when the collision happen we are actually crossing these two pencils and you know they are coming they are crossing and they are going to their respective pipes so in LHC there are two pipes running concentrically parallel and because once they are moving around they are not 
interacting with each other only at the point where the detector is sitting they are interact at the center of the detector okay now that was about uh, the quadrupole and the sextupole but we have to make them go in a circle so if you recall newton's first law that you know uh, nothing changes its direction until unless acted upon by external agency or force uh, so we cannot make the protons go in a circle we need to give some force and that force is given by the dipole magnet so what happens a particle is moving or the bunch is moving we keep a dipole it bends a little so you know lhc is more of a polygon if you think you know it's it's a small straight section a small bent straight section small bend uh, you know so circle is nothing but a polygon with number of sides going to infinity right so that's what is lhc so here the dipoles are you know the magnets are keeping them together and making them go in a circle so that was about the trajectory but how do we increase the energy it is energy of the proton or the speed of the protons is increased by something called radio frequency cavities uh, which probably you may study if you haven't studied uh, in your future if you start keep physics uh, that gives the electric field okay so very naively speaking what happens there is a potential gradient between two cavities positive and negative a proton comes get attracted towards the negative terminal gets a small kick and that's what happens in several cavities and you have to keep uh, protons circling in this lhc passing through the rf cavities and every time it passes there is small kick in energy and we keep on doing until we reach the maximum energy that they can attain and the maximum speed okay so now before uh, yeah now going back to uh, ashok and then i'll come back to calorimeters ashok okay okay so while we are waiting for the communication to happen so coming back to calorimeters i had already talked about the tracking system but you know calorimeters how do you think we measure energy in a calorimeter so if you just think of the okay. very ashok, yes, okay have... okay sorry okay we go back to ashok. okay yeah since some of the students are from engineering background i want to show them the real uh, silicon structures we use for example here you will see the pixelated structures and you will see a small bump bonding done to read out the the signal so these small elements are encarved in a silicon wafer and these small structures give us a uh, you know the tracking information or vertexing information you can see if we are able to see through this uh, uh, micro through the microscope and on the on the bottom you can see the silicon sensor very very small silicon sensors so these silicon sensors having you know very very small volume 300 micron thickness or 200 micron uh, thickness are being used uh, for the for the for vertexing information or tracking information at the very center of the cms structure i can show you another a big uh, structure having a silicon sensors for example you know if as we were talking about a meter volume at the center of the uh, proton proton near to the proton proton collision so you can see different structures in silicon wafers and these silicon wafers having a tracking information is collected the signal is collected through these small chips the small very small chips and these chips are then connected to the to the uh, fiber readout and fiber signal goes through these clean fibers to the surface uh, uh, service cabin where we have the triggering boards or deck boards now the point is when you are trying to uh, get a signal from these uh, silicon sensors you have to bias them using the using the very very high voltage of say 600 volts or 500 volts and then uh, you can also need to run this electronic uh, electronics using a low voltage of say 3 volts or 4 volts depending on the requirement of this s6 so we are using a lot of s6 here and these s6 are being provided with the low voltage from the service cabin in in this small small service uh servicing you know uh, mobile or fl flat uh, cables also you can see i don't know how clear the signal is but you can see these clear fibers these clear fibers will run up to the service cabin and give you the redot signal why we use the clear fibers because the signal is very very fast very very close to speed of light and the the occupancy or uh, the granularity of the signal can be maintained i can show you another detector element which is very very you know as varun had might was talking to you about the about the scint scintillators we use for the electromagnetic calorimeter and this crystal is very very heavy this is compared to a plastic uh, a volume but this uh, lead tungsten crystals being a lead here 
lead is a very very high stable element having atomic number 82 and with the atomic number 82 the mass volume will be very mass density will be very very high so this uh, crystals can give you a shower of the uh, you know photons or electrons and you can measure from the shower the electron energy or the photon energy from coming from higgs like uh, particles now you can also see uh, uh the, the 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 latest muon detector which is called gem detector and in this gem detector this small hole which is of a 70 micron outer uh, diameter and this 70 micron uh, is encarved in a 60 uh, micron thick foil so very very thin foils are being used to get a one proportional counter this is one detector actually this one one channel of the element is corresponding to one one hole here so these small structures you can only see through this uh, microscope because we are dealing with micro micron level structures so you have to uh, see or read out through uh, another asics which are very very close to micron level bandwidths also you see a very very large detector here is this is called the cathode strip chamber and this cathode strip chamber is is sitting in the end caps of the cms yeah. where we try okay. to see the tracking information of the muons so over if, to you varun thank you yeah, thank you so before we go forward or move forward are there any questions for us okay we yeah. can move to if not there maybe is one, yeah there's one student asking a question Just yes please Hello, uh, hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. So my question was, uh, as uh, sir said that we each second we store uh, petabytes of data. So my question was, uh, uh, do we store that data in uh, in the raw form or do we some compression on raw form? <clears throat> okay, so uh, just to repeat the question, uh, so the question is that we have petabyte of data and in which form we store it, it's raw or some compressed form. So, uh, so as I mentioned, first of all, you know, uh, we get petabyte of data every second, which we reduce to about four gigabyte per second, three to four gigabyte is our data taking rate, okay, per second. But if you do take the cumulative data, it's roughly, you know, a gig, a petabyte of data for the year or something like that. So we have a grid which is connected through worldwide, okay? So the first form of data is stored in raw form, okay? Whatever comes out, we just keep or store the data in raw form. And then uh, there are few copies of that. And then it's processed with a lot of information is reduced and not kept. Uh, in the smaller versions of data set. So we have the raw format, then we have AOD format, then we have the nano AOD format. So we keep skimming through the data to a smaller subset. So for the physics studies, for a majority, like 90% of the physics studies, we can use the smallest skim data that we have, which has most copies. Probably skim data, you know, will have probably 20 or 30 copies sitting in different grids. Like we also have a very uh, big, uh, data center you know a, bit, a grid in tifr you know where a lot of copies are also sitting so people in india or if it's accessible from worldwide so some people outside are access some part of data is sitting in mumbai and being accessed by different people okay so we have raw data as well and we have some skim data as well which you know is have more copies than the raw format so the one thing i can add is <clears throat> here what meant by raw raw means just the coordinates uh, 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 coordinates and the energy just energy information mission from here mm, here and the final version that he said in the final version we will have like information about electrons how much energy it is uh, <clears throat> it is uh, what are the coordinates we can get so so, uh, so like for the energy of muons muons electrons like in terms of the particle this is the final version then we put the information convert this raw information into so before we move to level. you know uh, ashok and he will show you shifters i would like to say a few more things about you know so what we measure you know in the detector as you see we we have a set of detectors where we measure tracks 
which is just the position and the energy measurement. So that's all what we are measuring, the charge, the energy and the coordinates and rest all are computed variables based on different formulas and calculations that you have. So as Ram mentioned that what goes into the next version is derived variables or derived calculation like you know we do not even measure momentum directly we have energy we have direction so as momentum is a vector quantity we combine directions with the energy and we get the momentum okay so all those kind of variables are not there all the derived variables are not there in the raw format we just get direct information from detectors and when what we store is in the raw formats is the formats okay so I think Ashok is ready to show some of the shifter. Uh, yeah. Maybe just one last thing I can add, like no? later okay. maybe. Okay. okay, maybe we can. Okay. 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 Now you you as you have seen that, uh, you know, uh, you have the in the experimental cavern you have the CMS experiment, in service cavern you have the hardware to support the high voltage, low voltage gas units, but controls are from the surface, and on the surface, for example, here you can see electromagnetic calorimeter controls and you can see that different badges of the electromagnetic calorimeter we need the we need to supply the high voltage to the to the photon readouts and we also have to apply the low voltage to the electronics controls and also we have to notice the humidity and the temperature of these crystals the crystals i was showing in the in the room so the point is all this information is collected and you know through the through the bandwidth we can collect the information on the surface the shifters sitting here or from a remote can see this information and also tune the detector operations in the meanwhile you can get the the online data quality monitoring of these detectors and also the performance of these crystals or the transparency or other features can be done time to time we have to calibrate these crystals using the laser beam so we try to do these calibrations using the controls from the surface or from the remote from the desktops also in this control room this is the this is not only i have given you an example of electromagnetic control um, shifters but you you have the full muon controlling units here people are having shifts and they are trying to see and control the parameters of their operations of the muon systems and also the, the complete uh, CMS uh, is being controlled by and also being monitored by the, uh, the shifters here. We have shift leader, we have the technical shifters. And also there is a panel called the DSS panel where whenever you have the, you know, some incident of very, very, you know, say fire incident or something, the DSS panel, the safety system will, will take your detector out and will, will save the other subsystems uh, from this incident. So this infrastructure is also being uh, you know, laid down in the service cavern and experimental cavern and full control is done through the through the surface shifter. Okay. Yeah, so over to you, Varun. Yeah, so before Ram talks about this you know, beautiful picture, which I was on, but uh, I'll come back to the calorimeter because I think this is an important thing we should touch on. So how do you measure energy? So, uh, you know, you know the very simple principle of energy that it cannot be created nor destroyed. So how do we measure it? So we have a particle carrying certain energy coming in, you know, mostly, you know, so this electromagnetic calorimeter is a crystal calorimeter as it was shown uh, by Ashok that we have a very beautiful crystal made out of lead tungsten. Let's just take that example. So, you know, a particle <clears throat> comes, you know, a particle comes hit the crystal and it produces because it's transparent and it's a crystal it produces a flash of light in that crystal okay and once it produces so what happens the energy of the incoming particle converts into light energy okay and the amount of light we capture is the amount of energy the incoming particle was carrying okay so that's why it's very important to first of all make the crystal so clear then when the light is produced it's not going into the dead cells or dead components of the crystal so it should be absolutely clear and beautiful so that first of all it can produce a light and then we have photo sensors or photo detectors that captures light okay so that's a way he, how to measure energy you know converting one form of energy of the incoming particle to another now how to you know make sure what's the dimension of the calorimeter so particle should be contained or die within any calorimeter so this is true for any energy measurement across any experiment in the world that you know the particle should die in the calorimeter because if it's it won't die it will leave the calorimeter a fraction of the energy goes away 
and we did not know what fraction of energy went away and so we calculate the energy wrongly so to make sure that we measure to the best possible precision the calorimeter should contain the particle and another so this is a call a homogeneous calorimeter because we have one crystal that can calculate all the energy but you know if i come to the hadronic calorimeter which is this yellow one which you can see it's very big you know so hadrons which are made up of quarks they interact via the nuclear strong force because they interact by this known strong force as this name suggests if uh, it's a strong force and you know it can just bypass the crystal without leaving a small fraction of uh, with leaving only a very small you know 2 to 3% of energy so we cannot make a crystal to stop hadron so we have to make a hadron calorimeter of something else and because hadrons are strongly interactive so what was thought that you know instead of making a homogeneous calorimeter is to make a heterogeneous calorimeter you can think of in your real life you know to slow down a fast moving car you have a speed breaker okay so that's what we have some passive material which has a adds as a, you know act as a speed uh, or energy breaker so we have active layer which deposit the energy collects a fraction of energy a passive layer that slows down the hadrons then again a active layer so we have a uh, you know layers of active passive active passive and it slows down and we collect the energy you know in a segmented way obviously because it's a segmented calorimeter the energy measurement is not as precise as what we have in the electromagnetic calorimeter okay so that's naively talking how we measure energy and now i think we are close to one hour uh, i don't know if there are more we should ask questions. for the questions yes, so that's and why go to the questions and answers session yeah so questions Question. Yeah. We got one question. Yeah, there is one. Yes, there is one. Uh, Lusa, can can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So actually, I I want to know what what is the use of coordinates? Like you said, you get only the coordinates. So what are they used for? Like and why it is important to it? Oh, why it's important? Okay. So first of all, uh. coordinates you use to make tracks okay so if you have studied you know scalar quantities and vector quantities right so <clears throat> energy is a scalar quantity if you just measure energy that's it you cannot uh, so you cannot mass measure the mass of the particle you know the energy or mass relation right you need to measure mass you need energy and momentum or you need at least two quantities when you have three variables right so we cannot mass measure mass directly so we need both energy and momentum energy we measure using calorimeters now to measure momentum we need the direction of the particle so if there is no tracker we do not get the direction and to measure direction we need these coordinates where the particle from the tracker where the particle is moving and once we get the coordinates we connect the dots and we see so here you know this this layers if you see if you can see this you know Uh, diagram and my mouse moving so these are concentric layers of the tracker as the particle is moving we are getting hits here 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 and we connect these dots and we see uh, the track of the particle which tells the direction and hence the momentum okay was that clear or that answers your question yes sir okay so there is also a question on the screen which is i understand that the photon density in the beam decreases wants to proton density oh, i don't know if you meant proton density proton yeah density. yes so yes so probability of collision at each event so yes so you are right that you know because we have 200 uh, billion protons per bunch so every time we collect so now i come to the image which ram wanted to talk about you know this so out of this 200 billion collisions uh, 200 billion protons on average currently we are collide you know only roughly around 60 protons actually interact because these are positive charged particles so you know some will may get a head on interaction uh, mostly will just deviate at a very small angles because they are protons uh, they are positive charge particles so only these things happen with only roughly uh, on average 60 sometimes it will be less sometimes it's slightly more but on average just 60 protons actually interact out of 200 billion and the rest continue their journey so if you see you know we are losing a very small you know they, you can just do the simple maths 60 my, you know 200 billion minus 60 we lose very less and of, so we can maintain this uh, for 
once the LHC is filled with this uh, 200 billion protons, it can run for about 12 to 14 hours continuously. And obviously the density decreases over the period of time. So for a period of time to correct for this decreasing, what uh, LHC does, it tries to squeeze beam and uh, more and get, you know, it all depends at what angle the collisions happens. So the two bunches or the two pencils that I was talking about, they do not collide head on. Okay, they always coll collide at a very, very small angle. And you try to correct for that angle and squeeze the beam more and more, uh, even, you know, as a period, as a function of time to make sure that you are not, the probability is not going down too much. And once you, you know, it goes down, the beams are dumped after 12 to 14 hours, then LHC start filling the machine again. So we call this fill where, you know, the LHC is filled with roughly 12, 2300 bunches and each of this bunch carries 200 billion protons. And once the instantaneous luminosity or this density, as you can call it as well, decreases, then the beams are dumped and the machine is refilled with the fresh set of protons, uh, which takes roughly, you know, this interfill is roughly two hours, you know, but it can go longer depending upon the different situations. There are a few more questions. I think they'll come up one by one. Hello. Just wanted to ask, uh, you are collecting charged hadrons and neutral hadrons at uh, respective calorimeter. Are they used for further studies? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Charge hadrons and uh, neutral hadrons you are collecting at yeah. different calorimeters. Uh, yeah. Do you use them for further studies and how? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so there are different physics models that predicts different uh, particles being produced. Now, uh, you know, in this uh, hadron collider, we, uh, hadron uh, calorimeter, what you call as hadrons, uh, uh, we call them jets mostly, because if you see it's a jet of particle, we make a cone around it. Now, it's a charge hadron, neutral hadron, and uh, we based on uh, we use them we know their charge multiplicity what's the charge so depending upon different physics models because we study hundreds and hundreds of physics models and what's the final state whether we expect charge hadrons or neutral hadrons uh, is uh, like i can give you one small example that one of the studies that i'm doing uh, where we i'm looking for dark matter where the dark matter is being produced uh, decaying it's a 1 gev scale dark matter where uh, dark matter is uh, is produced with a Z prime where Z prime decays to two U quarks to U U bar. So, you know, in the detector, we cannot see U quarks, but what I will see is two charged hadrons. Okay. So these kind of distinguish uh, differences we can make. Okay. Depending, it all depends what physics you are looking for and what you expect from theory to, you know, to come out of the, that particular model. And then that's what we look in the detector. So, it's very analysis and physics dependent. Yeah, so we can make use of charge hadron. That's why it's very important. If we do not have a tracker and a magnet, we can never distinguish between a charge hadron and a neutral hadron. Uh, maybe just to make things clear, as he said in the, uh, it's a quark and uh, physics prohibit to see a individual quark. So, so quark can be seen in a detector as a cluster of particles. And those clusters, when the quark forms a cluster, they are charged as well as neutral hadrons both. So to predict the correct information about that quark, we need the information from charged as well as neutral hadrons. Any further question? Hello, sir. How is the CMS experiment contributing to the search for dark matter and other particles beyond the standard model? Oh. Uh, we are doing a lot of like I have done a lot of dark matter searches so I can take that question. So first of all, how do you detect dark matter in this experiment, right? So or if at all we can detect dark matter. So why first we call it dark because we cannot see it. We measure in direct ways. So we call it dark because we do not see it, right? So the particles so far we have seen and anything we have seen is carried by certain particles. So we assume uh, because we always have to make some assumptions that dark matter is carried by some particles which we call dark matter particles. And we also make the assumption that it has to be weakly interacting because uh, we haven't found it yet. So 
it has to be weekly interacting and it's massive because we have seen it has some weight because of astronomical observation so these are the observations uh, we uh, assumptions we make now when you know if you see my hands we have two protons colliding uh, and let's assume a, a model says that we produced one photon and one uh, dark matter particle okay so how can we see that so what we will see in the detector we because when we produce pro, uh, collide protons then particles fly in all the directions right they can fly in any direction so we resolve then in the transverse plane okay so when we resolve you know do the projection in the transverse plane what can happen so because the momentum is conserved right we go to very simple principle that the momentum is always conserved and in the initial state the initial momentum was zero right so in the transverse plane in the transverse plane the initial momentum was zero so the final momentum should always be zero right so when we see that the photon is produced in one direction and the dark matter is produced in other direction we only see photon right we do not see what's going on the other side because in the detector we cannot directly see the dark matter particle so what we will see we will we will not see anything so we can attribute that missing to something called missing transverse energy okay so we will also very normally call it met okay because men missing energy transverse energy so we will have met in one direction which is obviously calculated based on the uh, momentum of the other particle which is produced in the other direction as photon now we see how often such events are being produced in the detector there can be some real scenario as well you know where we have a photon and a z produced in a standard model where the z boson decays to two neutrinos now we have to look at the cross section how often that it can happen in reality uh, based on our theoretical calculations or cross sections and if we have excess of events you know more than what we is being predicted by theory if we see much more events than predicted uh, we can attribute to several things now it comes uh, to any you know we cannot directly say it's a dark matter particle we take all the new physics models or beyond standard models mod, uh, models and try to fit on that axis and if there are more than one axis you know more than one model that can fit that axis we have to look for more details that's why whenever a small axis or hint is given one cannot jump and claim that we have found x it's or y particle you need to validate with tens and twenties or many more properties and of those particles that you know even when the higgs was discovered it was said a new boson has been found without claiming it was a higgs boson until all the properties of that particle were studied so that's you know how you can start find dark matter so there is a possibility to find dark matter in cms uh, but uh, you know it's, uh, let's hope and we find it someday i can just for uh, like some of the early students i can just add one sentence a uh, sentence that uh, like oh, what he explained into the details like our job is uh, something happened and uh, like somebody did crime or something and like we need throughout the universe we need to find that one candidate so like it is a super duper messy something like this and now we need to try to uh, to uh, uh, try to catch them and try to catch them first we need to understand the properties by like theoretician gives us uh, some theory and the behavior how it behaves how it should look like so depending on those behaviors that he explained we just our job is so much challenging that try to understand the behavior and try to find which line it corresponds to from this uh, mess yeah that comes you know boils to the simple statement when i said earlier that we do simple physics but in a very very complicated way so this is a very beautiful example of that complicated way so you know when i mentioned that we have on average 60 collisions uh, in out of this 200 billion so this is how they look like in the detector and we have to find one out of this 60 and then once we find that one we have to find which all particles are associated with that one collision more questions yes am i audible yes yeah so some my follow up question is on dark matter itself uh, as you said that uh, a dark matter particle could appear uh, out of the collisions uh, but there are weakly interactive massive particles 
and they don't usually collide with each other and, and hence creating the dark matter illusion. So what are the chances of such collisions in our particle accelerators itself? Yeah, that kind of things are very difficult. So that's why, you know, uh, we cannot, uh, as I mentioned in the very beginning, that we make a lot of assumptions. So we probably cannot detect all uh, or, you know, if dark matter has some other nature, as you just correctly mentioned, that there are some models that predict dark matter as those natures. We probably won't be able to see it. We may get some, you know, indirect evidence from some other because uh, there are some long-lived particle searches that we do. From there, we can get some indirect hints that there is. But we need so uh, there are some direct detection uh, dark matter experiments across the world in different parts of the world. Like one is uh, LZ uh, Lux Zeppelin dark matter experiment, or there are some neutrino experiments that also search for dark matter. Uh, so we can, you know, get, if we can try to add what they are seeing, then we can just add. We cannot, uh, you know, claim or make discovery at this given moment independently, probably, for those models. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more question uh, on graviton. Uh, yeah. How to detect a graviton? If it's possible, can we do it with our current accelerators? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, so. We can do, but as the previous example that I gave, uh, you know, so this is, I think, the image of neutrinos being bombarding uh, all in the universe, but okay. So the gravitons, uh, because if you, you know, before even going to graviton, as we know, all the three forces, you know, electromagnetic, nuclear strong, nuclear force, that the four fundamentals we know for, they are always carried by some particles. So that's why, you know, we assume gravity that's there for the longest period of time. It should also be carried by this particle called graviton. Or, you know, if you find it, you can name it after your name, you know. But uh, uh, it should also be, first of all, carried by some particle. So that's the fundamental assumption, first of all, that why there should be a graviton. Now, there are different models that try to predict how you can produce graviton. Many of those models... Uh, uh, explain uh, have you know can be produced in accelerators but there may be some models which say that it cannot be produced so for things that have never been discussed uh, discovered you can uh, you know theoreticians phenomenologists even experimentalists can make a lot of different hypotheses predictions but until we discover you know we cannot say anything with certainty because if we know uh, with certainty or with even a small certainty we would have find it found it so it's you know it's it's like one it's there are few problems we know we we try to look for the for them for the best possible ways but you know we cannot say anything with certainty because we haven't found it but like we like we measure for dark matter we also measure for graviton for different physics models we have a very rigorous program for measuring uh, find uh, looking for gravitons as well hello no, yeah. So my question is that as CERN has four different experiments going on, Atlas, Alice, LHCB, and CMS. So out of these, Atlas, Alice, and LHCB are uh, very close to uh, SPS and CMS, as we saw in the diagram, is uh, opposite. Yeah. Like opposite. So, like, any specific reason why this location is selected? There is one simple reason, I think, that I can think of. That, you know, because Atlas and CMS, they do the same kind of physics. They are all both general purpose detector. And, you know, they take the same proton beam to, you know, and there is just one accelerator in the world. And, you know, they do the same physics so they need to be complementary to each other in fact when they were made it was decided to use complementary technologies wherever possible okay so in a circle they were kept as far as possible so that you know there is some unbiasedness to them so in a circle that's the farthest you can go and you cannot afford to make another LHC across the globe because it costs a lot of money, not just money. They are very limited people, scientific community. That's why, you know, we try to invite, you know, a lot of young people to come join physics and be physicists so, or accelerator physicists. So, that's the only reason, nothing more. Uh, that Maybe I don't know if there are more. No, actually, accelerator demands your symmetric positions with respect to the uh, 
you know, experiments demanding the same luminosity. So you have a you, your Alice and uh, Alice is Alice is in very very close to the locations where people live. LSCB is also very close to city. Uh, Atlas is very close to CERN campus even. But uh, you know, point five where we are sitting right now, it is due to the you know you have to deliver almost same luminosities, but still Atlas has a little more luminosity than C and a little more. But it is the symmetry configuration you want to choose to deliver the luminosities at each end. So it is the accelerator compulsion that we have to choose a symmetric composition to have almost the equal luminosities, although there is a, a 0.5 or 0.4% between them. First, you are not that audible. Slightly uh, the volume has come down. Oh, is the mic? Yeah, I think. Okay. No, I was just saying yeah. it is a symmetric position with respect to the rings. Huh? You, have, you want to choose the symmetric uh, positions. Yeah. So yeah. you're, 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 you want to, Atlas and CMS wants to have similar luminosities. Uh, similar, um, you know, bunches colliding and giving you similar kind of event rates. So the point is, as as much as you have a uh, symmetrical positions, it is the it is specific to the accelerator demands. Yeah. Another question is, uh, can you share some light on how uh, CMS is helping study the higher dimensions? Hierarchies, there are many hierarchies we talk in physics. So one of the hierarchy we have already gone through is the Higgs mechanism. Huh? We have already gone through uh, through all this discovery of the Higgs to demonstrate that spontaneous symmetry breaking do exist. And in this case, if it, it was existing, it is existing through experimental uh, feature of the Higgs. So it is one of the hierarchy we have already gone through. There are other hierarchies, small, small hierarchies. You know, you search for a flavor violations, the the lepton or very good number violations you see in the physics, uh, in the high energy physics. So it depends on which hierarchy you want to go through. And behind the hierarchy, there is a symmetrical principle you go through. And as you might, you some of you know the uh, know that when there is a symmetry, there is a conservation law. So if you break a symmetry, you break a, a conservation law, and you find something new. And Higgs mechanism was one of the things we found in these uh, hierarchical uh, physics uh, problems. I think we are stopping now, Jultan. Yeah, we can take maybe one last if question. If we have a question more. OK. Any ahead. more questions? One or two last question. Or... Uh, uh, there is one question. Uh, that uh, the experiment is performed every day. Now, uh, regular basis, you know, that proton beam is passed in, it is collided with another proton beam. Then, is uh, the experiment yield differently every time, or there are some similarities between the uh, uh, previous experiment and in the current experiment going on? Oh. Yes, uh, we, you know, energies we have reached is 7000 uh, GeV. So 7 TeV. It is the first time we have reached this energy, 6.8 uh, TeV or so. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the higher energies, yes, you, you need uh, bigger magnets, you need. Uh, yes. You need, uh, uh, you know, more um, uh, infrastructure. So if you go to the previous experiment, no, I SSPPS, think this question but is the question? The question is, was asking that every time we collide, uh, so do we see the same result or how often we see different results? So the so uncertainty, uncertainty is below 2% actually. If you, you try to create the similar, uh, you know, <clears throat> collision environment, and uncertainty on this collision environment, which comes from the luminosity, for example, is below 2% or so. so. And most of the uncertainty from the accelerator is only 1.5%. So almost uh, equal. So, okay. So in terms of physics, you know, so when you collide two protons, uh, it all depends uh, what's the cross section, uh, you know, because if you know standard model, there is a probability for each process to happen. And every time you collide, it's uh, they can be different particles. First of all, when you are colliding protons, you are not actually colliding protons because if you know protons are made up of three type of quarks, the valence quarks and a sea of quarks, which are rest of the other quarks and gluons. So when you are colliding, you are colliding one quark with another quark, with quark with anti quark, quark with a gluon, gluon with another gluon, or gluon with anti quark. So there is a lot more pop, pop, you know. Uh, probabilities uh, that happen. So whenever the, the initial state is different, so the final state can also be different. And as you may know that, you know, when two proton interacts, it can go to different uh, final particles. So it all depends what's the cross section. Now the cross section vary at the center of mass energy. As you collide at different end center of mass energy, the cross section difference. What is a cross section? The probability of any process to happen. 
so how often one process can happen uh, we do not know this is what nature decides okay what will be produced it's but statistically you can say that you know 10 times out of 1000 times this x process will happen or five times this process will happen like higgs you know it will it probably will be produced in one in billion times and or million that's why we need to collect a lot more data than you know to find this rare process because we know this beyond standard processes are very rare so we need to collect a lot of data to collect or to hopefully first of all to trigger on this rare process and then when we study to detect those rare processes so it's a multitude of problem that we have to deal with but every collision can produce different process uh, depending upon uh, dif how they are produced Hello, sir. I have a question on recently discovered demon particle. Uh, it is tend to be a massless, electrically neutral, and transparent quasi particles. So, is sir working on it? And if at all it is working on it, uh, what kind of applications are there? Sir? So, it is you know uh, these are very very uh, you know we are calling about um, you know hadronic states. Hadronic states can be having, we can have from uh, three quarks or three antiquarks or quark antiquark pair. But there are higher models where you can have a three quark plus quark antiquark pair. So if these kind of uh, states, which are very, very, you know, which are probable, you know, according to standard model, they are possible. And if you discover these states, you have to accompany in which landscape they fall. Of course, this is a one of the part of the standard model. The bigger picture is Higgs and you know W mass we have already seen. But in the smaller pictures, these things exist, and there is nothing beyond standard model uh, which we have discovered in in the in the LSC design or in the CMS ex experiment design. So these you know small uh, quark, anti-quark, or three quarks or uh, you know five quark states do exist in different uh, regimes, and uh, there is nothing beyond standard model physics which we have discovered here at CERN. And you know, in terms of application, I will just add one last sentence. I think uh, you know whatever we discover here, you know these are fundamental particles, and applications takes a lot more time. First of all, you need to study that particles, uh, how they react, how we can produce. And applications come, you know, maybe decades or two decades or sometime it can take even longer or shorter. So you cannot un un make application of a particle until you un understand it fully. So applications definitely take a lot more time. So anything we discover, you cannot talk about application immediately. Any last question, I think, because it's getting over past time. So one last question, if there is any. One last question. Sir, actually, during your explanation, you said that in the hadron calorimeter, particles may die. What does this actually mean? Means Sorry, particles? Particles may die. Actually, you lose energy, OK? Huh, so this, what Varun meant is you lose energy, and it stop at a moment. Kind of so it's. It's the die. What I mean, die is that I meant die is energetically like die. Energetically, die. so it convert its energy into some other and particle or some other form of energy. Like uh, the electron or photon came, and it produces light. So the entire energy of the electron converted into light. Obviously, it converted into you know light is also electron and photon, but the energy that it was carrying converted into light. So the incoming proton photon died in the calorimeter. And it converted all its energy into light, and which we capture in photon. That's what I meant by dye. So basically, the particle should be contained, and its energy is converted into some other form that is detected using sensors. And then again, you know, that energy is digitized. It's digitized, and then it goes. It converted into optical light. That that's you know that's how it's transported in the optical fibers that we have. So it's being converted continuously from one form to another. But in the calorimeter. When the particle hit it, it should just be completely deposit its energy in the calorie meter. So transform its have, energy. So if we have some particle with some mass, and let's say it is coming with some kinetic energy, so yeah. its kinetic energy is also going to tend, and that particle is also going to get converted into equivalent amount of energy. So the total two state, energy is yeah. Two statements here. Particles are always having mass. Huh? One thing, huh? you remember that particle we call about has a particle having some spin, having some mass. 
it may be neutral in charge it may be a charge particle electrically but there are some other charges we also talk about in in particle physics but it has a mass and it has some decay time and it has some some spin now uh uh of course the energy we talk about at lsc or cms is always the kinetic energy always energy we talk about in particle physics is always the kinetic energy 7000 gev or 7 tv for proton is the kinetic energy it's not the rest mass energy so whenever we talk about is always the kinetic energy of the particle so we try to detect or if you want to talk about if you are measuring an energy it is always the kinetic energy of the particle the second thing you talk about is the momentum momentum comes from as you, we were discussing what the coordinates we call in chi relativistic kinematics at the lorentz variables you want to construct the transverse momentum out of px and py and this px py what ram was talking about were the coordinates in that uh, relativistic uh, uh, mechanics so in relativistic mechanics the kinetic energy and the transverse momenta are you know are itself part of this and transformenta is constructed from the from the variables which we call as the px py and these are the variables which ram was talking about the the coordinates at that stage so yes kinetic energy of the particle is the energy we talk about and you know even if neutrino is we call it as a massless it is a, it is also having a tiny mass and it is not the gravitational mass you want to see but these these are the masses we we pick ev and tv and why we we talk about these masses energy in gev and tv then you can see on google the planck unit, planck's units we use and not the the usual si units we use and try to equalize the situation we are living in in particle physics any more question oh there is hello uh, do we have have time for one more question or uh, we have you can take one question and i i hope ram can answer that question because he was silent for a moment ram you take this okay. question okay go ahead so my question is that if we find a particle which is like we are finding it first time so and and we, it is having a probability very less of finding it so do we consider it as an error or you will try to do it do the experiment again and again to find it again so basically i will <coughs> sorry uh, I, i will try to answer this from just a simple dice ex, uh, dice experiment so uh, so uh, so if you want to ensure that uh, if you if you are throwing a dice and uh, you, you will get one so you will just throw five times and calculate its probability then also calculate its its error bar so the error bar will be too high and when you again throw it then you will count the uh, the the what you get the probability you may not get it but if you if you throw the die, dice 100 times your your error bar will reduce if you throw 1000 100000 so similarly your error bar will will get and as the error bar bar will start reducing means means you will say okay Okay, my probability is one by six plus minus point zero one, plus minus point zero zero one. So the same thing when I observe probability, uh, and uh, like when I get an object, like for example, recently the W boson mass. So we we obtained we measured its mass, but now the general day-to-day -day life physics does not matter much if our W boson mass is it. I mean, very bit. i mean you won't see but but if we try to go into the details of the physics and try to understand the minor then then whether the w boson mass is 80.01 or 80.05 but these minor effects matters a lot and these minor effects should be the key of new physics so we just try to understand it and see and try to reduce the error and to reduce the error we need Collect lots and lots of the data. Um, is the answer clear or sorry? Uh, due to the time, I just try to explain it in a simple way. Thank you. Yes, yes, it was very clear. Right? Yeah, I think uh, maybe we wind up now and. Uh...
Yeah, actually, uh, you know, Sutta Maran will present a vote of thanks, and they are all very grateful. <laughs> Thank you so much on behalf of the Department of Physics, Sathya College Autonomous. I am here to present a vote of thanks. First of all, I thank uh, Mandakini Patil Madam, Dr. Mandakini Patil Madam, for arranging and coordinating the entire CMS2. Uh, then I thank uh, Mr. Petra Barbaro, Varun Sh uh, Mr. Varun Sharma, Mr. Ashok Kumar, and Ms. Naomi Beni, and Mr. Ram. Uh, for helping us for this journey. Uh, actually, watching uh, this CMS experiment through Dr. Asha Kumar's lens was an amazing experience and it was feast for our eyes. Uh, I also thank our uh, board member, board member of Parnadya Kritana Association, that is our management, uh, Mr. Bansidhar Durandar sir, for being here. Uh, I thank our principal, Dr. Madhav Rajbadi sir, uh, who is a physics faculty as well for always uh, encouraging gesture. Uh, there, I mean, there has been always a positive impact. I mean, I would like to conclude uh, with this note that there always has been a positive impact of uh, visits to different research institutes. I mean, whichever research institute we have visited, after two or three years, our students have got we lost but, our or place. maybe uh, at the faculty. So I'm hopeful that in coming years, our students also will be ready to, or rather they will get equipped to join the so, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank Good you. luck Thank to you. all Bye. the students. Bye-bye.